Hi everyone, welcome to uh, the seminar. Um, today we've got um, Jaden Newstead from the University of Melbourne and the, the Centre of Excellence for, for Dark Matter Particle Physics. Um, so Jaden is, is an expert on, on the direct detection of dark matter. He's worked on various topics um, related to, to direct detection experiments. Um, so he's, he originally got um, his master's from uh, Monash uh, before going to the US uh, where he did his PhD at um, uh, in Arizona before doing the postdocs uh, uh, at Purdue and now at, um, at Melbourne. Um, so it's great to have, have Jaden with us um, from, from, from Melbourne, uh, similarly locked down uh, to us. Um, and uh, yeah, please, please take it away. Thanks, Kieran. Yeah, so uh, today I'll talk about, um, it's really three papers um, over the last year and a bit. Uh, where we started to consider inelastic dark matter. I hadn't really considered it much, um, but we sort of hit onto a, a few different ideas we wanted to explore uh, and uh, it all ended up being focused on uh, light, light and inelastic dark matter, which people hadn't really explored um, ways to detect it. So yeah, I need to work out how to change slides from here. There we go. Okay, so just a quick introduction. Uh, inelastic dark matter um, it has a, a lot of different um, models and instantiations, but the, the major property of inelastic dark matter is that when it interacts with the standard model, uh, it, the in and out states aren't the same. Um, and so they, they typically you have some mass splitting between uh, the in and out states and uh, we call that mass splitting delta. So you'll see delta throughout this talk to represent the mass splitting. Um, and that what that does is depending on the size of the mass splitting, it can it, obviously it messes with the, the normal kinematics. So you don't have elastic scattering anymore. And it can, for various non-relativistic contexts can make the dark matter harder to discover. Uh, and like many things, uh, it was actually first introduced as, as a model. I say model lightly because there weren't a lot of details um, to reconcile the Dharma signal with super CDMS's null result. So the way you do that is this kinematically. It, it's possible that um, because of the different masses in the Dharma detector, the nuclei in the Dharma detector versus super CDMS, uh, kinematically, you can hide uh, the inel inelastic dark matter in super CDMS, but have it still show up in Dharma. And they could do that with a mass splitting of um, 100 keV. Um, and compared, that's small compared to uh, the typical wind mass, which is of order GeV. Um, and yeah, so since then, it's been explored in a whole variety of contexts. And, and didn't try and even attempt to do a, a literature review um, here. Um, but yeah, so some interesting things that we came across. Um, we first last year used it to explain the xenon one ton excess um, when we just happened to also be thinking about it um, for some work that's still ongoing that sort of got put on the back burner. Um, and this, so these three series of papers that I'm going to talk about today um, with these collaborators, Nicole, my, my boss here in Melbourne, James Dent, Baskar, Sumit, who are all uh, in Texas, Jason Kumar's uh, in Hawaii, and Ian Shoemaker's over in Virginia. So just quickly, um, not going into much detail of the cosmology of dark matter, uh, of inelastic dark matter, but generically, thank you. Uh, you can have just a, a normal thermal freeze out uh, of the dark matter, uh, and in that in the, in the typical scenario, you will predominantly uh, have that dark matter be composed of the lighter state, um, and I mean that depends. It depends heavily on the model. But if you have, say, a not particularly long lifetime, um, then 
the heavier state can decay down into the lighter state of dark matter. And that's certainly the case in, in models of supersymmetry. Uh, but there are, it is possible, so in some models, uh, and this is just one example, Bramante and Song, um, that you can find certain regions of parameter space where a significant fraction of the primordial dark matter is in the heavier state. Uh, but what you need for that to be the case is you need a very long lifetime. Um, so if you want it to still be around today, lifetime has to be uh, billions of years, tens of billions of years. And you need the interconversion cutoff temperature so in the early universe uh, to be larger than the mass splitting. And that's so that otherwise um, you have this Boltzmann suppression factor that will come up. So I'm going to define this parameter. It'll just it'll show up a few times throughout uh, the talk. It's just the fraction of dark matter in the excited state. <laughs> um, so the fraction of dark matter in the excited state over the total uh, number density. Um, so yeah, if this if this number if this fraction f is 0.5, then means that you've got equal abundances of of each of um, the types of dark matter, the heavy state and the light state. And yeah, so you need this, this temperature to be particular, you want it to be quite a bit larger than delta, the mass splitting, otherwise uh, this will become small. Okay, so I drew this roadmap or it sort of evolved over the last year and a bit um, for the different ways that you might detect inelastic dark matter. Uh, and these are the various signatures that you could get. And um, we just sort of start chipping away and um, filling in the different regions of this. So starting on the left, if you have non-relativistic dark matter in the galactic halo, uh, it could upscatter. And that could have been cosmologically or it could have been uh, in the present day. Um, and that could have been, that could have happened non-relativistically. So you have slow moving, upscattered, heavy state dark matter uh, and that could decay in your detector, producing a visible event. And that's something we'll look at first. Um, but then you have these other possibilities where the cosmic ray, cosmic ray population could upscatter and produce a fast moving um, dark matter particle uh, in the heavy state or the light state. Uh, and those can scatter in the detector. Uh, and then you also have the possibility of, of these MIGDAL events, which I'll get into what that means soon. So we'll come back to this a few times. So first, when in the context of light dark matter, uh, we have a problem with the uh, experiments being sensitive to it. And that's because non-relativistic dark matter has a maximum velocity of about 760 kilometers a second. Uh, that's in the lab frame of the Earth. And that's just due to the fact that if anything was moving faster in the vicinity of the Earth, it would escape the galaxy. It would be above the galactic escape velocity of about 540-ish kilometers per second. And then the extra bit of velocity comes from the velocity of the Earth moving through the dark matter halo. And that means that you have limited kinetic energy of the dark matter particle to produce recoils in your detector signatures. It's the maximum nuclear or maximum target recoil uh, energy you can have uh, goes as reduced mass squared divided by the target mass and then V squared. So for heavier targets, if these are nuclear targets, uh, then this um, drops off pretty quickly. And for the context of light dark matter that we're going to be talking about, you can think of mu as just becoming approximately what the light, the light dark matter mass. So light dark matter mass, where we might be thinking of having it below a GeV or below 5 GeV, is going to be much smaller than your target. Uh, and so uh, the maximum recoil energy starts to get pretty small pretty quickly and down to orders of K, just an order of 1 KeV, uh, which is challenging to detect. Okay, so the first paper, I'm just gonna go chronologically through these papers that we've been working on, um, is about explaining the xenon one time excess with luminous dark matter. So this is this first scenario that I talked about where you have 
upscatter of the non-relativistic dark matter, which then decays, giving you a visible event in the detector. So in June 2010, uh, the Xenon-1-Tung collaboration reported on this excess. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, this data on the right, these data, uh, you'll see that there's a, these first two uh, bins after the first lowest bin um, are significantly above uh, this background model that they had. And this is the data from one ton uh, times 226 days. So it's not quite the full uh, exposure. And these were single scatter events. You know, they looked over a wide range. Uh, but between one and seven keV, these bins, uh, you have 285 events observed when 232 were expected. So this is about a 3.5 sigma fluctuation. Now the collaboration went on and tried to interpret the success in terms of, uh, they looked at adding tritium decays, which is not a great fit, solar axions, neutrino magnetic moment, um, and also actually bosonic dark matter. I forgot to add that on here. Oh, yeah, there it is. And bosonic dark matter. Uh, but it also attracted to the attention of uh, quite a few theorists. And I was keeping track for a while. And then I got to, I was just keeping a tab on, on, the, on the papers. Um, I think I lost track around 80. And these days, there's, there's over 100. This paper has 300 citations. That, and there are hundreds of attempted um, explanations of it. Uh, and so the main challenge really of, of explaining this was to get uh, electronic recoils that are very low energy for one thing. So this is in the one to seven keV region um, and have them uh, not show up in the nuclear recoil band. So you can't have something that interacts strongly with the nuclear recoils, um, otherwise you'd see it in the heavier area. Um, and and yeah, it has to be quite sharp because of this lower, um, this bin that was down here, you have to have something that produces a pretty sharp spike of events, which is not typical for, especially for non-relativistic dark matter. So the first thing that we noticed was just that if you just take a line and you smear it with the detector resolution that they provided, uh, then you have a perfectly good fit um, so it's, you don't need to invoke much to get to this point. Um, so you could just say, since these are electron recoils, that it's a photon. You have a photon line, and the best fit turns out to be around 2.7 keV. And you need about 70 events per ton per year in that, in that line um, source. So here on the left is our fit uh, using uh, adding the tritium, adding in just a line, and then adding tritium and the line. And you find that even if you're including tritium, the line produces a much better fit. Um, the tritium takes up a few of the events. Um, and I think that's mostly just because the tritium gets dragged up trying to explain the, a little bit of a bump here. Um, but you can still have a, a line source uh, fitting these, um, these two bins. Uh, and that's demonstrated by the chi-square as a function of the photon energy on the right. Um, so yeah, the tritium improves your fit, but not greatly. Um, and then if you include the line, you, you have a much better fit. Um, and yeah, and the, the position of the line isn't strongly dependent on whether you include tritium or not. So then how do we explain this in terms of dark matter? Uh, so luminous dark matter uh, is an idea that's now over a decade old, first uh, proposed by Feldstein. Uh, and it entails having dark matter upscatter in the earth and um, then decay via a photon in the detector. And again, this was uh, proposed as a possible um, solution for Dharma. And I mean, sub subsequently, I think it was ruled out um, for that particular uh, version of it. 
Um, but so the picture you have here is that dark matter in the halo can come in. And in our, in our version of it, we just suggested upscatters within the detector because it made it a little bit simpler. Uh, so you have dark matter come in, scatter on the xenon, uh, and then the outgoing dark matter is, is the heavier state. And then if it's short-lived enough, it will decay within the detector. Uh, you have it decay into a photon. And so long as your mass splitting is uh, about the 2.7 keV that you need, um, that photon will have 2.7 keV because the dark matter's kinetic energy is, is very low. It's non-relativistic. Um, and then, yeah, so then the dark matter leaves the detector, but you, you just see the photon. Uh, so just to see that this was not crazy, um, the median lifetime, uh, or the median time of the, the excited dark matter in the detector is of order of microseconds. So given it's the outgoing velocity, it'll leave the detector within microseconds. Um, so you need to have a lifetime that's of that order uh, to be able to, for this explanation to work. And if you had just a completely standard magnetic dipole transition and you take the tree level uh, approximation for the magnetic dipole, uh, this is the answer you get. So for a 2.7 keV uh, delta, you'd need a dark matter mass that's about a GeV or lower to get a lifetime uh, that's in the vicinity of microseconds. So it meant like just in a completely bog standard magnetic dipole um, framework, this wouldn't precisely work, but um, you wouldn't be far off. So it would be possible to have um, potentially to cook up models with a, a larger magnetic dipole, um, say if you had composite dark matter. And so what we, what, since we're saying it had to scatter in the detector, we also had to check that the, the scattering in the detector didn't cause uh, a, an observable um, recoil, since the main job of xenon one ton was to look for nuclear recoils. And we were suggesting that there was an upscattering of dark matter um, by nuclear recoils. So just checking it against the, the different um, xenon one ton analyses, so either the S1 or S2 only. Um, so these, these are just the different channels uh, that they're looking at. Um, S1 are prompt photons and S2 are the delayed extracted electrons. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry too much about the details of that. They're just separate analyses. The S2 only analysis is better at looking for uh, low mass dark matter, uh, but it doesn't have the background rejection capability of the full analysis. So along this dotted line it is where we can uh, explain uh, the xenon one ton excess. And so for a pretty wide range of masses, uh, we're able, we fall below uh, the limits that xenon one ton itself sets. Uh, but nicely, it's this is the nice thing to do is, it, is that when you suggest something that it's not so far out of range that a future experiment might not be able to probe it. So a future, uh, well, so xenon n ton, which is already running, uh, we just scaled up the exposure by a factor of 10. Um, and you can see that you start to be able to probe the parameter space. Okay, so just moving on from that quickly uh, to just looking at standard inelastic direct detection. So before we get on to looking at the Migdal effect, I just wanted to look at uh, what is what, what happens during the nuclear recoil uh, when you have inelastic dark matter. So there's one modification, there's a simple modification that you make, and that is that the minimum velocity of the dark matter coming in to produce a recoil ER uh, gets modified by this term. So you have a delta um, times the reduced mass. And this is in the commonly taken approximation that the mass splitting is much smaller than, than the dark matter mass. And so your, uh, your reduced mass of the initial is the same as your reduced mass of the final. So we have, there's, there's two regimes. You have 
endothermic and exothermic scattering. Either the incoming or the outgoing uh, will be lighter. So uh, endothermic, meaning that this state is heavier, so it takes energy uh, when it scatters. And exothermic being if this one is lighter, um, then it can release extra energy during the scattering process. So I just produced two uh, example recoil rates uh, in xenon uh, with the 5 GV dark matter coming in and a small cross section to minus 45 centimeters. And, and then just plotted a bunch of these uh, different mass splittings just to give you a feeling of, of what this looks like. So as, as you increase, and as in the endothermic case, as you increase delta, you very quickly, uh, your rate shrinks uh, and the range of recoil energies gets tighter. And you can just see that from here that if some of the energy has to go into, um, into the delta, so making a heavier state on the way out, um, then you have less phase space. So there's your V-min goes up, which means there's fewer dark matter particles in the halo that can contribute um, to the scattering process and, and the rate goes down. Uh, on the flip side, if you have exothermic, um, you don't have this problem of reducing um, the phase space. Um, so here the rates stay about the same um, and they're squeezing up because we're measuring per keV here and this is a log scale. Um, yeah, you can explore much larger mass splittings here, uh, but you see that as the mass splitting gets larger, eventually uh, this sort of gets tighter and tighter and uh, you stop increasing uh, the recoil energy. So this can be a way to get a little bit more sensitivity to light dark matter um, if, if you're an exothermic, but you're limited by the cosmological scenario I was talking about that uh, generally only half of your dark matter is in uh, this heavier state. And then it also becomes harder to produce larger mass splittings and, and cook up models where you have long lifetimes. Um, but yeah, this, certainly this is explored and it even is explored to explain the xenon one time excess uh, where you're scattering on electrons. Sorry, just to check, I, I understand. So the, the integral under those curves on the right-hand side is the, is the same. They just shifted to, to higher yeah. energies. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah since the, the cross-section is, the total cross-section is kept constant there. Um, yeah, I think as so long as this, uh, the recoil range, uh, the kinematics work out, I think it pretty much is exactly the same. Okay, so if you if then you just look at xenon uh, one ton and say what uh, what bounds can we set um, in this case? So I've got a bunch of plots here, uh, a bunch of lines. Just concentrate on the solid ones for a second. This is the endothermic scenario. So as you increase delta, as you have a larger mass splitting for the outgoing particle, uh, you you set worse and worse uh, bounds. So you lose sensitivity to light. Um, dark matter particles uh, very rapidly. Uh, and that's, as Kizzo keeps saying, it's totally due to the kinematics of the non-relativistic um, incoming particles. Um, so yeah, by the time you get to 100 uh, keV, uh, you're only setting bounds above 30, what is this, 20, 30, 40 uh, GeV dark matter. Uh, on the flip side, if you go the other way and you do uh, uh, exothermic scattering, then the extra kinetic energy you get uh, helps you down to a point. Um, and what's, happen what's happening though is that um, as you get further, most of the kinetic energy ends up being taken away by the light dark matter particle itself to conserve momentum. So there's a limit sort of, you, you, don't, you can't just go to infinitely small uh, dark matter mass uh, by having this, uh, a large mass splitting. Also, eventually your, your approximation is gonna to start to break down uh, of this delta being much smaller than the mass. Okay, so we were, we were wondering if, we, if there was a way we could extend the reach to lighter masses. Um, and so that's where we started looking at uh, the MIGDAL events. 
And so we, we looked at both possibilities where you have non-relativistic dark matter that's uh, first either in the halo as this chi prime, the heavier state, which downscatters as a MIGDAL event, or you have an upscatter as a MIGDAL event. And that's this paper. Uh, so a quick one slide on what the MIGDAL effect is. The amygdala affects ionization uh, due to a nuclear recoil. So I've taken this nice plot because I haven't seen anyone else um, plot this nice picture because I haven't seen anyone do it any better from uh, Matt Dolan's paper. Uh, and I think Felix Karlhofer was on this one too. Uh, if the dark matter comes in and it has a nuclear recoil, you can think of it as the nucleus recoiling before the electron cloud realizes. Um, and so you can, it just is like an undergrad quantum mechanics problem. Um, if you have a perturbation to the, the uh, potential that the electrons are sitting in, uh, you can treat this as sort of as a, a very basic um, quantum mechanics problem. Uh, you perturb that potential and then there's a chance that the electron uh, will pick up some kinetic energy and be kicked out of the atom, get excited. Uh, yeah, so actually it can be just excited or you can actually kick it out and free the electron. Now it turns out that freeing it is the, um, the dominant uh, and easier thing to observe. Uh, it turns out, again, this was first applied to direct detection uh, by Burnaby et al. Uh, for Dharma. Um, not specifically just to explain it, um, but it was to well, it, it just they explored it, I guess, just to extend the possible parameter space that can explain dharma. Um, right, and it was sort of the, the main paper that reinvigorated people's interest in it uh, was this Ibe et al. paper uh, from 2017. And they did the first proper atomic calculations of, of this process. And what you can see, what you're looking at here is that this, this black curve is the rate of nuclear recoils. And then these colors are the rates of excitation from either N equals five, N equals four, N equals three shells of, of the xenon atom. And this is for two GV dark matter. So what's happening is that since uh, your nuclear recoil has a very small amount of energy that wouldn't be observable in, in, uh, in a direct detection experiment, uh, but these electrons have a lot uh, higher uh, energies. And so they're much easier to see. Um, in addition, the, the nuclear recoil gets quenched, which makes it even harder to see. A lot, a lot of the energy goes into heat and the electrons can more directly be sort of uh, extracted and read out. So the utility of the MIGDAL effect is that it increases your sensitivity to light dark matter. And you can see that just by looking at this exclusion curve. Um, this is also from Matt's uh, paper. Um, the xenon experiments, uh, their sensitivity falls off way down uh, above a GeV. Um, but here um, in this sub GeV range, uh, the MIGDAL effect is able to um, rule out um, new parameter space. Uh, in this case, it even beats uh, the light uh, of the experiments that have really low thresholds, so CREST and Super CDMS. Uh, so why does this work? Uh, the, as we saw before, the maximum nuclear rate, uh, nuclear recoil energy is, is goes as reduced mass squared over the target mass. Uh, the maximum inelastic energy into a MIGDAL effect, uh, or the electromagnetic energy in the MIGDAL effect, uh, just goes as the reduced mass. Um, these may both have a V squared. Uh, so yeah, and then as I was saying before, the electronic energy isn't quenched. So just kinematically, you just have more available um, energy uh, for, it's basically for light particles, so either if you had a photon or if you had um, an electron, yeah, that, that can carry away more kinetic energy. Uh, than a nucleus can. So here are our plots uh, where we looked at it for inelastic scattering. Um, so all up till now, people have only looked at uh, 
amygdala effect due to elastic nuclear recoils. Uh, even though it is an inelastic process in itself, um, we uh, extended it to include inelastic dark matter. So incoming and outgoing dark matter states don't have the same energy. And so this is just an example, um, endothermic. So the solid here, um, if we just, just look at the left plot for now, uh, the solid curves are the elastic rate and uh, the, uh, these dashed ones are, sorry, the dashed is the elastic and then the solid is the inelastic uh, as a 4 keV mass splitting. Um, yeah, I should have just been reading off my uh, legend here. Um, and what you see is that you get a slight uh, change in, in the shape of these curves, but nothing too drastic. Uh, most of the change is in the kinematic endpoint. Um, which you can't even uh, really see uh, on this scale. Uh, and yeah, so the kinematic endpoint you see does change a bit for the nuclear recoil, however. So um, it makes, it has the effect of making this nuclear recoil even harder to see. Uh, in the exothermic case, it's, it's sort of uh, slightly uh, the opposite. Um, so if you have a negative, in this case, when I have negative deltas, I mean it's exothermic. Um, you increase slightly the ability to see the dark matter through the nuclear recoil in solid because the kinematic, kinematic endpoints extended a bit. Um, and then otherwise, uh, the migdal events have a similar shape, but you just increase um, increased the uh, phase space a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. So if you use uh, those, uh, those rates and constrain the dark matter as a function of mass, uh, this is what we found. So let's um, just look at the solid curves for a second. These, this is how the dark matter, uh, the dark, this is how the limit changes for um, exothermic in green and endothermic in red uh, for just the normal, uh, analysis, not using the Mignol effect. So there isn't a big uh, movement in, in the limits. Uh, but for the Mignol effect, uh, the normal standard Mignol effect, uh, looking at this, um, look at the dot dashed line first for xenon one ton. Uh, you see that the Mig this is just the standard Mignol effects. This is what has been published before. You gain a lot of extra uh, exclusion power down to much lower masses. Now, if you now include, in, or if you had inelastic scattering with a 10 keV mass splitting, uh, this curve gets bent all the way down and it becomes basically flat to very low energies. So what's going on is, is that um, the dark matter is able to supply 10 keV of energy, extra kinetic energy to shake the, um, the nucleus and that is plenty of energy to shake off um, electrons in xenon. Um, and that holds down to very, very low masses. Now, we've cut this off at the left um, because um, it's something like, uh, what is this? So this is one, one MeV here. Um, down much below this, your migdal approximation starts to break down. And so it would need a more detailed analysis. Basically the migdal calculation is done assuming isolated atoms um, and, and some other approximations. And so we don't trust those going down to arbitrary low masses. <clears throat> uh, right, and then on the other side, if we have an endothermic scattering, then you, very slightly improve the reach. Um, so going from this red normal uh, curve to, to here, you only very slightly improve the reach. And that's the saying that a lot of your, uh, a lot of the energy that would have been going to um, the migdal electrons is going to your heavier outgoing dark matter state. So the migdal effect isn't very useful for endothermic scattering, uh, but it would be for exothermic scattering. Um, and then the last thing to sort of comment on here is that we can't constrain, we can't claim to constrain just 
the uh, cross section here, because if we're doing in inelastic uh, exothermic scattering, then not all of the dark matter may be in the heavier state to begin with. So we've this is constraining a product of of the fraction of dark matter in the excited state, um, and and this uh, cross section of protons. So and this, and this might be maximally a half, um, say for for scenarios where you're doing exothermic scattering. Right. Ask what's the difference between um, xenon one ton and LZ here? Oh, yeah. So LZ, I just took some parameters from from their TDR and. Here, xenon one ton. Yeah, thanks for asking, because I didn't point out this was using the S two only analysis from xenon one ton. Turns out that's the most sensitive for for migdal, um, for the migdal effect, um, because you get that extra low uh, low energy um, low threshold um, analysis. So when I compared it to xenon one uh, LZ, I didn't do an S2 style analysis for LZ. Um, and that's that's just simply because LZ hasn't been built and the S2 analysis is, um, it's, it's got a lot of partic things particular to xenon one ton. Like it, there's, there was no way to estimate the size of the background, say, mm, yeah. LZ. Yeah, the so LZ it presumably has a higher target mass because it's you've got slightly yeah. uh, better reach. So the, the main it. difference comes down to LZ has a much larger target mass um, and exposure compared to the S2 only analysis, but uh, it has it won't have as good of a low energy threshold. Um, now, of course, once they run LZ, they may do their own S2 only analysis, and it'll have a lower threshold, and then you may get more. Uh, you might see these curves be more parallel to each other. Um, but without that information, it was hard to project that. So, yeah, that's that's why the difference is there. I should say any other questions while we're here? Okay. Um, well, maybe I well maybe I can ask it now. Um, so the the, um, the breakdown of the MIGDAL approximation, there, like an MEV, what was what's that based on technically? Um, so. I mean, is there some like requirement which which ends up which it I don't know, some like length scale or energy scale which ends up yeah. meaning that MEV is the kind of is the cutoff. If you think about the the time scale of the collision um, and the time scale of of the atomic process, that is goes inversely with the uh, energy. And as you go to lighter dark matter, you have um, so you have longer time scales of scattering. And this was pointed out by. Tong Li um, in the Tong Yan Lin um, in the context of uh, dielectrics, and so what they were more concerned about was semiconductors. What they were more concerned about was uh, the atom banging into neighboring atoms. Uh, so it's not a perfect analogy in xenon, but this free atom approximation would break down if. Uh, if say that atom runs into another atom, and in a liquid, I just used uh, I, I took a few estimates of how long between collisions of xenon atoms, or how long it takes for the xenon atom to uh, traverse the inter uh, atomic spacing in, in a liquid, just to sort of place a limit on uh, what's the time scale of which you can pretend a xenon atom in a liquid is completely isolated. Um, from its surroundings, and and then we just took that as the mass, uh, a mass that produces that time scale um, of a collision. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, um, so just one word on distinguishing uh, dark matter. So normally you can do a pretty good job, um, depending on uh, the detectors and such that you're using, of of determining what the mass and cross-section is of, of the scattering particles, but there, there are some important degeneracies. And we were just wondering what would happen in, in this case. So uh, just as an example, I took 
elastic scattering uh, dark matter um, here on the left with half a GeV mass. And then I tried to fit curves with an inelastic parameter of 4 keV with different mass particles and allowed the cross sections to float. Um, and the higher mass regions of, of the middle spectra uh, are fairly degenerate. Uh, there are some big differences at low mass and at the kinetic kinematic endpoint, um, but these are both technological challenges that you'd have to overcome. So uh, the high mass, that's the high mass, the high energy tail, you'll need very large exposures to be able to map that correctly. Uh, and you'll need very low thresholds to probe down, down here. So in principle, these are distinguishable scenarios, but uh, you have some degeneracies probably in, in any initial experiment you did of um, what are the dark matter parameters producing amygdal scattering. Uh, and the same goes uh, for a slightly heavier dark matter particle. It's actually a little bit worse um, because the kinematic endpoint's even further away. Um, but then uh, maybe the thresholds don't have to be improved that much to start to see differences between the, the spectra. Okay, so in the last, 15 minutes, I think I've got, I'll try and finish a bit earlier um, for some questions. Um, I'll talk about cosmic ray dark matter. Uh, this was our most recent paper. And um, yes, yeah, so that's this part of the diagram. So cosmic ray dark matter uh, is when a local population of, of dark matter in the galactic halo is scattered to high energy uh, by the local interstellar spectrum of, of uh, cosmic rays. So the sort of important thing with this is when you're talking about just direct detection of dark matter uh, and you have, you're assuming that there's some nuclear uh, cross section. So if you're already looking for that, um, then in the normal paradigm, you would also have sort of for free these cosmic ray interactions with the dark matter. And that would be upscattering some of your dark matter to relativistic velocities, which makes them easier to detect. Uh, in the case of inelastic uh, that we're going to talk about, um, the outgoing particle would, would be the heavier state. So we're pretending all the initial state is in the light state and the outgoing dark matter is in the heavier state. Uh, so the original idea is from Bringman and Pospilov, and they considered a very basic model um, of isotropic scattering um, that's independent of energy. Uh, and that was, this is sort of a proof of concept to show that uh, xenon, say for example, xenon one ton, but also um, neutrino detectors are sensitive and can produce uh, useful constraints uh, on the dark matter parameter space. Uh, down to very low masses. So again, we're sitting in the sub GV range where this is useful. Okay, so we're, because we're considering two things, I wanted to show a couple of examples uh, of this uh, different flux. Um, oh, my, my figure cap uh, legend has dropped off here, uh, but we have two scenarios here. Uh, the right's gonna be a heavy scenario so it's 100 uh, MeV dark matter uh, with a heavier mediator. And on the left is actually a 1 MeV dark matter with 1 MeV mediator. Um, so yeah, when you upscatter uh, and the uh, dark matter is very light, you can produce these very sort of sharp line uh, lines of energy uh, of the spectra of dark matter, of our, the outgoing spectrum of dark matter. Uh, but what we need to do is then we have to potentially let it decay. So after it's upscattered, it won't necessarily reach the earth in the upscattered state, it may decay. Uh, and so, yeah, okay, I got my, my legends back properly. Um, so these different curves uh, correspond to different mass splittings. So elastic is in blue, and then as we increase uh, the mass splitting, you have smaller and a smaller and smaller flux. Uh, and that's again, um, due to kinematics. 
Um, but importantly, you get useful fluxes out even for up to 100 MeV mass splitting. So we're in a very different regime from where we were in the non-relativistic dark matter, where we could only probe things with up to 100 keV mass splittings. And that was sort of our interest um, in why we started exploring this, because we thought we'd be able to access new parameter space um, of inelastic dark matter. Now, if the decay produces the photon, it doesn't have to. You, you could make this some, some dark state, um, some dark photon state that wouldn't be observable. But if, if it was, uh, if it did decay via a photon, then this could be observed by Fermi. Uh, so this gets um, this photon uh, in the lab frame, it gets a boost and it can have up to a GeV of energy um, in, in this heavy scenario, um, or it's over, sorry, that's up to 10 GeV and above. And, and this is the light, the light case. It produces sharper spectra that might be easier to pick above a background. But for now, the intergalactic background, so this is the Fermi intergalactic gamma ray background. Um, it's uh, the, basically the background that already exists is much larger than, than what you would see from these. Um, but importantly, this would have an interesting um, spectrum on the sky um, as, a, as a function of position on the sky. So you'd have a stronger signal coming from the center of the galaxy, which could be looked for although then your astrophysical backgrounds become larger. Um, we haven't really delved into that part of the analysis. Um, just wanted to earmark that. Um, so yeah, then this upscattered dark matter that's moving relativistically reaches your detector on Earth. And if it's the heavy dark matter, it downscatters exothermically, or if it's the lighter state, it'll upscatter again. Um, so these plots show in solid endothermic scattering and dash the exothermic scattering. Um, and I know you're probably at this point getting plot fatigue. So I'll just point out a few features, um, mostly that the, there are large degeneracies here. So that normally, if you think back earlier in our non-relativistic case, um, the spectra changed shape a lot uh, with, the, with the inelastic parameter. But here, when you're talking about relativistic dark matter, um, the spectra doesn't change shape nearly as much. So these become harder to distinguish. Uh, and then putting that onto a linear plot, because it, it's sort of easier to think about, um, easier to sort of interpret as what an experiment would see. Um, in all but a few cases uh, where you have very large mass splittings, uh, these would be hard to tell apart. Um, and then I've also overplotted this with a non-relativistic uh, dark matter particle, um, which also looks similar. So uh, we would need to come up with some new ideas of how to tease apart uh, these different signatures of inelastic scattering in detectors, uh, which, yeah, obviously you would have very different um, ratios of rates in different targets, for example, but that's, that's something that we haven't explored yet. So lastly, uh, the exclusion limits uh, for this plot. So what, what's the region of parameter space that um, we'd be able to exclude, exclude? Again, this is using xenon one ton nuclear recoils. Um, if you look at the left first, this is the light mediator case, the one MeV mediators. Um, and basically the, I've left off uh, any previous constraints here um, for two reasons. One is that as soon as you go to our away from elastic to just having a 100 keV mass splitting, um, your non-relativistic constraints uh, just disappear basically. Uh, and the other problem is that, that you have attenuation, uh, which I'll talk about in a second if we have, have any more time. Uh, and the problem is that with large couplings, the dark matter can't actually reach underground. Um, right, so this is the elastic uh, in blue here. And then as we increase uh, the mass splitting, uh, you're able to constrain less and less, um, basically because there's not enough energy in the cosmic rays that cause the upscattering initially. Um, and, if, and then the other thing to point out is that in solid we have endothermic dash exothermic. So when you have exothermic scattering, 
um, this is downscattering in the detector, you get an extra kick of energy. So it makes it, again, a little bit easier to detect. So you exclude more in the exothermic case. Um, but that, again, requires that you have very long-lived dark matter. Um, so it upscatters somewhere out in the galactic halo and then it has to survive maybe a, I don't know, have a lifetime of a year or more um, so that it reaches the Earth and downscatters in the Earth uh, in our detector. Uh, but sort of what you can think of is that if, if there was a finite lifetime between a year and, and um, promptly decaying back, uh, then the exclusion limits would actually be a mixture. You'd have a mixture of states. So they'd be somewhere, they'd lie somewhere between these two curves. Um, and then on the right, you see the same result for heavy mediator. So this is to point out that uh, it's very dependent on the, the mediator mass that you choose. Um, so, and also it'll become very model dependent for the type of mediator. <clears throat> uh yeah so i'm running out of time i just wanted to flag that an important thing that we haven't treated when full uh with full rigor is that you need to consider dark matter getting attenuated before it gets down to the detector so especially as you have relativistic dark matter coming in and with uh large cross sections uh it will scatter in the earth before it gets down to the detector um, so you have to solve the energy loss equation um, as it propagates down through the Earth. Uh, there's some other treatments using Monte Carlo's. Um, yeah, and basically, you can. You, there are some approximations you can take, which is what we've done, um, and it won't be as good as doing the full Monte Carlo, but uh, it gets you there. It gets you an, an a, basically a an approximation that gives you a starting point. So what we've done is just say, we've taken the dark matter, we've propagated it down through the earth. And we, we just assume that above 10 GeV that there'll be an elastic hadronic effects that will dominate. So we just find what is the cross section where 10 GeV dark matter will be attenuated down to where its energy will be so low that it won't produce a, a recoil above threshold in xenon one term. And then this becomes a slightly mass dependent um, statement. So when you put it onto this uh, plot, um, it basically looks pretty flat, but it starts to curve down for heavier dark matter. So everything, the way you can think about this, everything above this dashed line uh, won't actually make it down to the detector. Uh, these are the limits that we had before in these solid lines. So it is pleasingly at least above there, uh, above where we're setting limits. So we would still see this type of inelastic cosmic ray dark matter. Uh, and then these dashed lines, I didn't explain this. The, the, these are the limits you would get from Fermi. So that is to say that the, I pointed out that if the dark matter is decaying, um, it didn't look like uh, the flux would be high enough to observe. But if while we're talking about really high uh, cross sections, large cross sections, um, it would actually start to produce uh, signals that you would be able to see. And those are more pronounced when you have larger mass splittings because you get higher energy uh, photons. So it sort of comes in and rescues you. If you're in the regime where dark matter is getting attenuated and not reaching your detector, well, it might actually be possible to see it um, decaying in the sky instead. Okay, so I'm just going to leave this up as a summary slide. Thanks again to uh, my collaborators. Um, so we've sort of now tagged all of these different parts of this diagram. Um, uh, and so it's time for me to find something new to work on uh, after we have one more inelastic dark matter paper in the pipeline. But yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Great, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, yeah, do we have any questions from, from anyone? Um, please just go ahead. Um, maybe I can start. Um, so, well, I have a few things. What's the most pressing? Um, <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, I guess I was, I was curious about the morphology of this gamma ray signal because it's mm. kind of like a 
So presumably this is kind of like a Darmata decay signal rather than a, so it goes like a linear power of the density rather than the squared power like annihilation. Is, yeah. is that right? So it's, you're going to be slightly less peaked towards the galactic center than, yeah. than for like an annihilation. Yeah. So I guess, I guess this isn't like, yeah, you're, you're not making any claims about explaining the GV excess or anything like that, right? No. <laughs> No, we, and I think you'd need to, like, like your cross sections would have to be too large for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what I didn't say about what we did to get the Fermi limit was that we actually just exclude the galactic um, plane. We go 20 degrees above the galactic oh, latitude yeah. and integrate over the rest of the sky. Okay. Yeah. Because then you're, you're less, yeah, you're less penalized because you, you still got a pretty decent, I guess, D factor like out of the, the plane. Yeah. Do you have to worry about the, because, doesn't this also scale with like the density of cosmic rays as well? Would you need, do you need to? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and I was brushing over a lot of the technical details. So we assume that we only set limits based on going out to one kiloparsec. So saying that dark matter or the photons would only come from within a bubble of one kiloparsec of the earth. And in that region, we say that the dark matter um, is approximately constant, but we, you actually correct it with an NFW profile, mm -hmm. uh, but we assume the cosmic rays are completely um, the same as what's measured by the LIS. So not like in the vicinity of Earth, but like um, outside the sun's effect. Uh, we project, pretend that the, we have homogeneous cosmic rays throughout that zone. Yeah. I, I did produce some plots uh, a couple of years ago for cosmic ray dark matter where I like used Galprop to get a model of the cosmic rays. It just there's so many knobs to turn with Galprop, and we have very few measurements of like cosmic rays that it's hard to claim much about cosmic rays that you know more than a few kiloparsecs away from the Earth. So that gets tricky to it just becomes very model dependent and assumption dependent. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I can ask my, my other question. So um, the um, the plots you show where you were setting limits using xenon for this cosmic ray dark matter, um, what happens if the, because I think in the original possible off paper, they had like some neutrino experiments like mini boon and mm. maybe boroxino or stuff. Do they, are they no longer competitive or um, um, what happens to them? So. They use mini boon because basically it's more shallow. Um, so like I do it here. Mini boon was useful because it's not shielded by as much yeah. overburden. So it sort of closes this gap. And then other people have found that other, putting in other things, Dia Bay, I think, can help you close some of these other gaps. Um, where Super K was useful was for um, just scattering on hydrogen. I think it was super K, was it? Or was it? No, it was boroxino, sorry. Boroxino was useful for spin dependent dark matter mm -hmm. where you're okay. just scattering on protons on hydrogen. Uh, so for us, it just made the most sense to stick with um, xenon one ton. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we totally didn't explore. So it might be useful with some of these um, large mass splittings that may be in a, in a large detector, especially with the neutrino detectors that have very large exposures, but large thresholds. Um, it might be more useful, um, but since we found the scattering is still, well, you still have peaks in the scattering around tens of KeV. Um, we thought xenon one ton would still produce the best limits. Um, but it would certainly be something to look at. Um, so I, I've one very, it's, it seems like a very, very minor thing, but in the plot where you were showing the rates for like the attenuated versus the like non attenuated case. Yeah. For very small recoil energies, it seems like you slightly enhance the rate. Mm. Yeah. Um, what's the, physics going on there i guess it's completely negligible probably well i don't know that's what's log scale and well it's, it's a very very small energy range, but like what's the physics going on there so it's because you're 
you preserve the number of dark matter particles. Um, so they get slowed down, but they end up somewhere. So they just produce lower mm. energy recoils until they're like fully attenuated um, or reflected or something. So this, this obviously this isn't including everything. And that's why a Monte Carlo might be better. Um, but yeah, like, cause you can get some weird like funneling effects or reflection effects. Um, yeah, but in, in, in just this formalism, if you slow them down, they become slower, but they still interact just with less energy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I started exploring putting these together, um, but you end up with more moving parts of, you push everything down below threshold and then you can use the Migdal effect to gain sensitivity back to this pile up of very low energy, slow moving dark matter. Um, but numerically it's it's really annoying <laughs> i guess know. at some at some point like some way off the edge of the plot they're getting captured by the earth and yeah so you're right yeah so somewhere down down here yeah they would they would probably be getting captured yeah yeah i don't know how low energy we are um Okay, well, if we don't have any more uh, questions, then we can uh, wrap up the uh, recording there. I'll just stop recording.